Hey, what is up, bros and hoes? Brad the Guitologist here, and in today's video, we are gonna take a look at something pretty darn special, if I do say so myself. This is a Fender Champ 5F1, and uh, this one is in really, really nice shape. Uh, we're gonna check out what kind of shape it's in on the inside, and if it's half as nice on the inside as this thing is on the outside, whoa mama. This is going to be a really cool one today, so definitely stick around for this one. Okay, examining the top of this thing a little bit more closely, this handle is here and is intact and in good condition. Uh, the chassis looks pretty good, and that would clean up rather nicely, I do believe. I mean, that's got a lot of shine to it, even as is. But we are going to uh, focus on the electronics and getting the electronics in order. This is honest. I mean, this is, um, it's not like this thing has been recovered or somebody has something to hide here. This is the original covering. And this thing is just in really nice shape. Let's pop the back door off of it and we'll get a little bit closer look now at the guts. The 5F1 as opposed to the 5C1 has a 12AX7 in the preamp. The 5C1 had a 6SJ7 in the preamp with a single ended uh, 6V6 output, 5Y3 rectifier, really simple amps, about as simple as you could possibly get and still have a guitar amp, uh, frankly. You could get a little bit simpler if you wanted to dispense with the power transformer and do a, a little Whittlemaker amp. This is pretty much beauty incarnate as far as uh, electronics goes. It doesn't get much simpler or more elegant than this, and this one is untouched. Frankly, as, as much as I despise, kind of, I don't despise, I just don't necessarily agree with the practice of being all precious about, you know, old components. This might be one, just because of the collectability factor, where we might take the extra step of pulling these uh, old Astrons and uh, re maybe restuffing them if uh, we can get something that will fit. We could get away with some 450 volts, uh, lower quality capacitors here, but what I would like to do is actually go to at least like some F&Ts, if not um, Sprague's. I know I have F&Ts in stock that we could do this with for sure so we might and, and fnt's are fantastic uh caps and nobody's gonna thumb their noses at that if they go to buy this thing which is what i think the uh, the current owner of this that's his goal is to uh is to flip it so he's he bought it i believe to sell it because that's kind of what he does he uh, buys and trades a lot so and heck this might even be one that i might even consider trading trading him for but you can see right here we've got some problems for sure we've got uh, one cap is this one's busted right here on the end so it's just it's been spewing electrolyte material out it's just flicking away right there you know that's got to be all yummy to breathe in and maybe even consume some of it orally a lot of dust down here on the bottom and i'm sure that smells nice probably smells really lovely whenever the thing gets really heated up <laughs> sure we've got these mica mold sort of style molded blue caps we'll test those and see if they're okay it's there's a good chance they might be okay these tend to hold up all right compared to some of the other ones like the yellow astrons um are kind of hit and miss in my experience i mean let, i'm gonna be honest um, I, I just I just don't get too precious with stuff like this, man. If something has a cap and it needs to go and it's bad, I don't see the point in being real precious with it and saying, oh, it's the mo you're gonna lose the mojo if you replace the cap. No, you're not. You're just gonna make the amp perform as it's supposed to, you know? And this is definitely one of those where I won't throw any of this stuff away. I'll shove it in a baggie for the guy because it's a collectible grade amp. Now, something that's less collectible, it's not that big of a freaking deal. Um, just get the, get rid of the stuff that's bad. There's no sense in being precious with it. You know, I just, I don't see the point the, normally. Now this one, you know, because of the collectability factor, maybe there's an argument to be made here for trying to see if we can get something to restuff these with. And then we'll we'll thoroughly test these and make sure they're okay. If they're okay, we'll, we'll just leave them. Because if his goal is going to be to sell it, he is probably going to want to present this as 
you know, something that's been gone through, but something that's been gone through respectfully. And respectfully would mean really leaving these if we can. Um, and, you know, leaving any resistors that are not uh, uh, too far out of spec. Uh, and the ones that are too far out of spec, maybe we'll try to um, see if in my stash I've got some that are of the same exact type. We do have a death capacitor we're going to have to clip out. Other than that, this is going to be very straightforward. It's going to be a very fun one to do. We'll do all we have to do is basically clean this. We'll check and make sure. I'm going to pull, go ahead and pull that to make sure I remember to check that. And yeah, you know, I mean, we might test a couple tubes and that's going to be just about it. And then we're going to get to the demo phase of this, but which is going to be pretty fun most likely because man these things can sound really good here recently i went to my friend steve's studio he has about six or seven of these man that are sat out in his studio and uh, he plugged one of them up for my buddy bosco when we were over there I'll, I'll put up a clip right here check check out how his sounded over there <laughs> Sounds phenomenal and actually keeps up with drums and bass, believe it or not. Okay, so there's the tube chart if you're the type of person who's interested in such things. Now, I am not, I am not uh, what I would consider a, much of a Fender scholar, to be honest. There are too many other people who are Fender scholars, really, for to make it interesting for me. <laughs> I'll be honest with you. So I, I don't, I haven't kept up with, you know, what the numbers and all that kind of stuff necessarily mean, the production up there. Um, the little 4C, I'm sure, means something to someone. You can see down there the Fullerton, California, and that's got the license information on there for AT&T, uh, because AT&T were the license holders on most of the early tube technology. We do have some visible date codes on these though you can see right there 6039 that's 1960 the 39th week and you can see a date code on that one as well 1960 the 39th week so this is definitely uh, made sometime in 1960 and maybe sold as late as 1961 or something like that I would guess um, the Tweed uh, champ actually survived well into the 60s i think all the way up to what 64 they were still making tweed champs even at the same time that they were making the brown face stuff there's a good chance i could stuff these capacitors i'm gonna show you what the candidates are for what could go in here now i could definitely put something in here that will fit inside of those for instance if i went with a 22 on this first stage or something like that i mean that would definitely fit inside of there and then what i would probably do um, is kind of cap off the ends and then sort of glue the glue some ends into place and then just have this suspended inside of there and then probably what i would want to do after doing something like that just to warn future techs that hey this is a restuffed cap i would probably put a some kind of little sticker with a note here uh, explaining you know who I am what the date is and explaining that these caps are restuffed uh, the other options would be like a spray if I wanted to do like a 20 microfarad spray but see how much that that's even larger than the original I mean sprays are nice caps and all but the, the thing is whatever I put in here I would want to match and I only have spray in a 20 and I don't have it in like a, the 8 or 10. And it's okay to go from like a 16 up to a 20. It's not going to change the fundamental character of the amp. It, it, you're not that far off. And upping that value is not going to do anything except uh, maybe even help smooth more ripple. Okay, so here's a 22 F and T. That would definitely fit inside of this if we decided to restuff. And that's a definite possibility. And then we've got an 8. So here's what the 10 microfarads look like on the F and T's, and they would just fit in there as well. I think that's what we're gonna do for him. Uh, we're gonna pull these old caps, and we're going to restuff them, and I'll restuff these as well, and we'll put a note on the back door that they've been restuffed. 
Can you imagine having owning an amp like this and using it so infrequently that you just you have all the spiders nests and stuff and spider webs just and all the original capacitors in this kind of condition? Can you imagine owning something like this and not not scratching the itch to make it right so you can play it? You know what I mean? So that tells me this is probably this is a closet queen, man. This thing has probably been in some old dude's closet for the last 50 years, would be my guess. And he just passed away recently, maybe, and this this was part of an estate sale, maybe. You know, you just kind of get a sense for this sort of thing after a while. And that's what it seems to me is probably going on here. We do have a uh, fuse that's correct. It's a two-amp fuse, which is what's called for. You could probably even get away with something even a little bit smaller than that, maybe even a one amp. But yeah, I think I'm going to go with the philosophy of trying to be overly cautious with this. This being a clearly a collectible amp from the, you know, the most collectible sort of era for Fender, you know, around 1960. This has got the 12AX7. It's the 5F1 champ. It's a classic amp. Why not just restuff the caps? It makes no sense to be an asshole about it, you know, just on some kind of stupid principle. And we have a Bugle Boy Amperex. All, everything's pretty much rubbed off there, but that's an Amperex 12AX7. So very, very nice. Man, you know, I just, you see something like this and it just reinforces your love for uh, old stuff. You know, old tube, tube technology when things were made so simple and they were made so right and just the, there was a magic to it that was just uh, lightning striking um, that wasn't necessarily even intended. I mean, the people that designed this stuff weren't even, some of some of them didn't even play guitar. You know what I mean? It's like Leo Fender didn't even play guitar. Of course, he didn't design all of his amps either. Other people designed amps that are often attributed to being designed by Leo Fender. You know, and, and the same could be said for uh, Nat Daniel, who was an early developer of. Uh, uh, tube guitar technology, you know, the stuff that he built sounds so phenomenal, um, and yet he didn't play. He didn't play guitar himself personally, so it's just, that's always fascinated me, that people who don't even play, that can't plug a guitar into these and then, and then put them through their paces, were able to come up with something that sent, really sounds so good, you know. We still have the two-prong cord on this thing, so that's got to go. And we're going to restuff some capacitors. Let's go ahead and pull the chassis and we'll get to work. Spider's nest there. Okay, so we've. this is a 1962. So those caps were already kind of old whenever they put those in. So there, if this isn't a 1960 amp, it's most likely from 1962 or possibly later. First things first, uh, the little death cap. We're gonna clip this out. I'm gonna actually solder that over here to the to the side, uh, so it'll be you know secure in here. So it, if somebody ever wants to, I don't know, hook it back up, <laughs> which why would you? Obviously, you wouldn't want to, but some people are crazy like that. Some people are crazy like that. We're going to fall in line with the crazies, I suppose. It's kind of like how, you know, sometimes uh, in classes of, you know, 30 or more students in a school, you know, the teacher has to kind of teach to the lowest common denominator. This is kind of the same, same sort of thing. It's a, it's a sales thing more than anything because if you... It's kind of a damned if you don't. I mean, I know the name of this channel is The Guitologist and all, but that doesn't mean that uh, I get all precious about seeing uh, every single thing original in an amp. It's just not important to me at all. Um, and, I don't, and I don't think it should be important to other people either. And generally, you know, I use my... Or at least I like to think I do. I use what what whatever influence that I have having a YouTube channel like this to, I don't know, sort of maybe dispel some of those myths that things like that are important or that they should be important to people. Because um, I just don't think that they should. 
So anyway, this doesn't have to be tight. It just has to stay out of the way. So, all right. So there's that. Anyway, so you can see what I've done here. I mean, it's just going from ground to over to ground. It's just, it's over here out of the way. That's, that's the purpose of that. Okay. So death capacitor done. Uh, next thing I want to do while I'm thinking about it, I'm going to go ahead and um, clean this pot. I'm going to spray that with some electronics lubricant, actually cleaner lubricant. And judging by the rest of it, you know, there's no telling. This might be the first time that that's ever been been cleaned. So, All right, so there are those cleaned. Go ahead and clean the tube sockets as well. This is a Sylvania. And this could be original. It's got a two. 18th week of 1962. Let me go ahead and I'm just gonna give this a little bit of a brush. Brush down here won't hurt. Since I'm under here anyway. getting rid of all the spider mojo man it's gonna change the tone tone webs this actually is a 606 this is a Schumacher um, transformer for this power transformer it's 606 to seventh week of 1962 and the output transformer is the is the seventh week of 1962 so there you go seventh seventh week of 1962 606 it's exactly what you want to see. And then this one, again, 606-207. Got a RCA 5Y3, and we've got that Sylvania power tube, and it is a 1962 power tube. Bugle Boy on the 12AX7. May even see if I've got a, uh, a cover for this for him. And with as pristine as this thing is, it wouldn't it wouldn't hurt to go ahead and make that correct. Okay, so there's that. I'm gonna, I'll, I'll, I'll gently wipe these tubes down as well. What I like to use on uh, stuff like that is um, just little wet wipes, like little baby wipes. So I'll get that and just kind of just gently wipe. You don't want to wipe over anything where, um, where there's ink, you know, like here on this 5Y3, because that, that'll, that'll wipe off. So there's no, um, you got to wipe around that kind of stuff. So I'm not going to wipe this one at all because it's already lost enough paint as it is. And I want you to be able to see what that is. And you probably wouldn't know it easily without having some of that white paint on there to know it's a, uh, it's an original Amperex. I might as well go ahead and knock some of this crap out of here. I think I think the population of uh, spiders in my house is going to go up after this job. I'm going to have a, a lot more little friends hanging around. 
around the bench here <laughs> with all these spider's eggs. I wonder what species that is. Hopefully it's not uh Hopefully that's not a fiddler spider. I can't stand those little bastards. My sister was bitten by one of those once when she was real little on the leg. I was bitten a couple times too, and it, I got some bad boils from it and had a bit of a reaction, but she had a real severe reaction from, uh, from a spider bite, uh, from a brown recluse spider. And uh, she had to go to the doctor and had this had to have a hole dug out of the back of her leg where the thing had bit bit her um, to get rid of all the basically, you know, gangrenous flesh that was rotting uh, off her body because she had a real bad reaction to it. But yeah, that's, that's much better. At least it's, you know, it's clean now. Okay, so there we are with uh, all of the offensive caps extracted. I'll go ahead and test the resistors before I put, get the caps back in there because they'll just kind of be out of the way. I'll go ahead and do that and, and make sure that all these are within spec and any that aren't, we'll try to replace them with stuff that looks the part. Okay, so I tested all of those on the multimeter and uh, everything tests pretty much within spec. They're not, uh, nothing was really much more than 10% off. Uh, a couple of these, these, these were just over 10% on those uh, little plate resistors, but I'm not going to sweat that. It's no biggie. Okay, so we're going to restuff uh, these caps, like I said. I should be able to just push the old cap out of the sleeve. 
without too much difficulty. If you're going to re be restuffing caps, these are about the easiest ones to do. Okay, so what I'll do is uh, I'll stuff this inside of here like so. You know, when you look in, they just, as a casual observer, you'll just see that this cap is in here and it'll, you know, it'll kind of look the part. And it's not trying to fool anybody. I mean, I want, we want them to know that the cap, caps are restuffed and not have them think it's the original caps. That's not, it's, the point is not to, for them to think it's original. The point is just so when you look in here, cosmetically, it looks, it looks like the amp originally would have looked. Okay, so there we are done with the restuffing and uh, reinsertion of those capacitors. Uh, so uh, pretty much the amp is done. I'm just gonna clean off the tubes a little bit here. And, and I'm gonna tell you a little secret about vintage amps, okay? Um, most vintage amps that you're gonna find, the tubes are usually the last thing that you have to end up changing. Well, maybe not the last. Usually the last would be like transformers or something, but you know, tubes don't go bad nearly as often as a lot of people seem to think. Um, I don't know if it's just that we've been trained to change tubes in accordance with a modern idea um, that applies maybe more often to more modern amplifiers. You know, I mean, there are a lot of amps that are kind of built for uh, intense overdrive and stuff like that, that, yeah, I can see maybe replacing the tubes a little more often in an amp like that um, to get the most out of them. But on an amp like this, uh, that's old school, that's usually pretty conservatively biased. I mean, for the most part, I mean, there are some amps that aren't. Fender Princeton kind of springs to mind that aren't that conservative on the bias and the specs and everything, but there are a lot of amps that are pretty conservative on their specs and the way that they run. And usually tubes last very, very well in old amps. And they're kind of one of the last things that you have to change. So just keep that in mind when you um, go to have a tube amp serviced that's old. You know, I mean, if, if somebody insists on changing, just changing all the tubes in the amp, you know, it's, it's at least ask for them back so that you can have them. Because a lot of the times, you know, they will still operate, even if they're not 100%, they will still operate in an amplifier. And uh, if not in the position that they were, were in, they would operate some, somewhere else just fine. One common failure with a tube is its inability to operate without microphonics, especially on a preamp tube. You know, oftentimes they'll, they'll just have to be noisy, but that same tube might be just fine in a different part of the circuit, say in the phase inverter or maybe in a tr uh, tremolo oscillator or something like that. So, you know, and the thing about old tubes, old RCAs, old Sylvanias, old GEs, things like that, old Amperex, uh, is that they aren't making any more of those, man. And if you start yanking them out of your amplifiers and throwing them away, that's the last you're ever gonna see of those tubes. And they're not easy to get back. I mean, there are some still out there, but it's getting harder and harder to find really good examples of some of these tubes. And, you know, if you're just throwing them away willy-nilly, you're doing yourself a disservice and you're doing, frankly, future generations a disservice who won't have the benefit of possibly coming across your amp with the original tubes in it. So just be very conservative when replacing your tubes. And, you know, if you insist on replacing them, do so, but keep the old tubes around and maybe even with the amp so that you can, you know, put them back in there later if, if, uh, if you want to, you know, just be smart about this kind of stuff. Uh, one other thing, I am going to put a shield on here. Let me see what I've got in my stash. I think I've got one. And I do. So that'll 
if it fits maybe that's why they didn't install one because it didn't fit right no it fits yeah that fits fine okay so now that that's shielded uh, we've got all of our tubes clean looking much better we've got the caps restuffed I am going to get a sticker of some kind um, to stick on the back uh, on the inside of this um, this back door just explaining uh, what the caps are um, the fact that they're stuffed and when they were stuffed I think it looks pretty damn good myself if I do say so myself I'll fire it up slowly on a Variac after we get it back in the cabinet and we will test out these little coupling capacitors right here and hope that those are okay. If they're not, we'll replace those with something. And if they are okay, then we're pretty much done and we'll give this thing a test. Okay, so this amp is completely done. I'm really happy with the way it came out. I fired this thing up uh, just now on the Variac, tested the other side of these capacitors to make sure there's no leaking voltage and there was none. I mean, these things are working exactly as they're supposed to. So those will not have to be replaced. Uh, like I said, all of the uh, resistors were within about 10% or so of tolerance. So, I mean, those are all good. I think this thing is an absolute closet queen and uh, is just lovely, man. I did end up putting some shielding tape on this back door. That's the one thing that these don't have is a little bit of shielding on the back. It just prevent a little bit more noise. And I also put in here a note about when this thing was serviced and about uh, restuffing the power caps with some F&Ts, you know, because if somebody looks in here or they're gonna buy this thing or somebody's trying to sell it or somebody's going to, you know, replace these caps, I want them to realize, hey, before you start ripping these things out, there's, you know, <laughs> they're, these are new caps, they're not old, so. But uh, in spite of that, I think it really came out looking nice. I mean, I think this is like the second time only I've ever gone through the trouble of restuffing caps in this way. And uh, to be honest, I'm kind of glad I did because this thing really looks the part. It looks nice and original when you open it up. And it just, you know, it's got that appearance of uh, what you expect to see when you open up an old Fender chassis like this. So yeah, let's get the back door back on this thing and give her a test.
Thank mm-hmm. you.